Welcome, everyone. I'm not going to stand right in front of this mic, but I don't think you'll have, have any trouble hearing me. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Steve Powell, who you see here, and uh, the state's involvement out on Swan Island and in the Bay. I'm going to talk a little bit about Steve himself. I'm going to talk about the records that he left that I've been working from. And then we're going to look at, oh, 60 plus photos from his collection. Uh, and I have a little supplemental information I'll add to the photos. And then we're going to watch about 25 minutes of silent film. And you don't have to hit, listen to me either. Um, but I think you'll find in some instances, for instance, when um, you see a thousand plus geese leave the bay in a silent film, I can hear them. And I think you'll be able to, too. Um, Steve always had a camera. Um, and we ended up, as I'll tell you, with the films, uh, with about 11 hours of film. Some of it's family stuff, most of it's environmental stuff. Um, Steve did a lot of work at trade shows, sportsman shows, um, talking with the good old boys. There weren't too many good old girls at that point in, in sports, in uh, uh, the outdoor uh, life. Although you'll see here that uh, Steve didn't go anywhere without his wife Polly at his side. Um, Steve married Polly, and Polly's twin sister was the mother of Bob and Richard Gleason, who's in the back here. So that's why Bob Gleason ended up uh, so involved with Steve Powell, because this was his uncle, and um, Robbie, I guess as they called him, um, was taken under the wing of Steve and uh, ended up uh, overseeing many of the same fields and orchards and so on that uh, Steve had started. So Steve was born in 1921 in, I believe, in Orono. Um, he attended the University of Maine, class of 1941. He got a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Conservation when he graduated. While he was at UMO, uh, he ran track. Uh, he was in ROTC. And he also, in the summer of 1938, went up to Gilead, Maine, and participated in the CCC camp, putting in many of the campsites and trails in the White Mountain National Forest. Uh, in 1940, before graduating from Orono, he and Joe Stickney uh, visited Swan Island. And this is from a letter uh, written in 1955. And uh, Steve says, in 1940, in company with Mr. Joseph Stickney, now dead, former head of the research division, Fish and Game, I visited the island with the idea of obtaining some land to use in carrying out a deer repellent development program. We needed an area where deer were present and where we could control our tests without outside interference. Then he goes on to talk about the electric ice box and the New Dresden Richmond Bridge and the no ferry zone and why people left the island and, and so on. So the state basically, while Steve went off to war, the state did buy up Swan Island, mostly in the early 1940s. And because uh, many of the talented uh, wildlife um, managers, if you will, were away at the war, they used some local labor and they basically modified the island from a series of, say, 15 or 16 up and downhill farms into much larger managed field systems. Uh, they put in ponds. Um, they graded the road with an old Model T with no wheels on it and did things like that. Um, so when Steve came back from the war, uh, he was honorably discharged December 15, 1945. He then moved on to the island with, with his wife, Polly, and they lived there until 1951 when their house was completed uh, at Greenpoint Farm, if you will, which is right across the channel of the Kennebec in Dresden and is now part of but the house itself isn't, but most of those lands are also part of the state's uh, wildlife management area. Uh, I, Steve was honored for his uh, role in the war, and I, I'd like to read this. Um, the President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Silver Star Medal to First Lieutenant Stephen E. Powell, and that was Edwin Powell, United States Marine Corps Reserve for service as set forth in the following citation. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity while attached to the ammunition company, 5th Field Depot, Supply Service, Fleet Marine Force, 
in action against enemy Japanese forces during the initial phase of the recapture of Guam, Marianas Islands, 21 July 1944. Exposing himself to hostile fire throughout the night, First Lieutenant Powell issued ammunition with the aid of a flashlight, despite constant danger from enemy snipers. When a hostile demolition party penetrated the outer defenses and threatened the ammunition dump, he organized and deployed his platoon to engage the Japanese troops and by defeating them averted destruction of vital supplies. His courageous devotion to duty was in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. For the President, John L. Sullivan, Secretary of the Navy. Um, Steve also is the one that cut out the cedar tree that has stood as the flagpole at the Pondleboro Courthouse in Dresden. <laughs> and every year at Memorial Day, we honor Steve along with all of the veterans that are buried in the cemetery there. Um, Steve actually ended up retiring in 1955 from the Marines as a lieutenant colonel retired. So he kept up his work uh, even when he came back from the war. Um, so Steve worked basically on the island when he lived there for those five or six years. And then he became more involved with wildlife management areas in general in the state and eventually oversaw all of them at the time of his retirement in 1968. And uh, amongst the records that he left behind, he kept um, week at a glance daily journals. And he'd say, um, uh, rebuilt this engine, lug some wood to the landing, and so on. And on uh, one particular date, and I've forgotten the date, in 1968, he wrote, I quit. And that was the end of his public service um, with uh, the Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife, or it might have been Fish and Game then, whatever the agency was called at the time. And he then um, retired to Greenpoint Farm, where he was very active with orcharding um, and some other crops. And unfortunately, three years later, in 1971, at the age of 49 or 50, he passed away. Um, so he had a very uh, short and brilliant career, let's put it that way. Um, some of the people you'll see in some of these pictures, Joe Stickney, who we mentioned, uh, was an early manager of Swan Island. So he was also a biologist, I believe. Uh, George Stobie was the commissioner at the time and a big supporter of Swan Island. And Don Higgins was a warden in the area who actually lived on Swan Island for quite a while. And he's the one, if any of you have been in um, the, with a house that, where they marked all of the critters, the critter count, um, that's, that was Don Higgins' work. Um, in terms of the records, uh, Bob Gleason had always been a little reluctant to turn them over to Inland Fish and Wildlife because he figured they'd go up to Sydney, be put in a file cabinet, and 10 years later, somebody come along and say, what's this, and they would vanish. So with um, the encouragement of Dr. Charles Burden, Charlie Burden, who started the Maine Maritime Museum, who had lived in the beautiful Red House right across the Eastern River for Bob from several years, uh, convinced Bob that um, all those records should be turned over to Charlie and myself so they could be organized and be placed with the state archives and so on. Um, at this point, uh, all of the film has been professionally conserved at the Northeast Historic Film um, up in Bucksport. Uh, they've all been digitized. Uh, the originals are all in climate control up there. All the splices were repaired. All the sprockets that were ripped out were repaired. I mean, they do great work up there. And I want to say that the whole seven DVDs, which is 11 hours of film, I think the price was about $1,200. So they're very reasonable. And Bob Gleason paid for that. When he, when he heard that they could be done, he said, what do you need? And uh, he paid for it on the spot um, to honor uh, Steve, basically. Uh, the inventory, the records are pretty amazing. Um, there are, for instance, the trapping journals of George Gershammer of North Belgrade, Maine from 1938 to 1962. It's 40 composition books giving dates, locations, number of pelts, number of traps set, bait used, weather, summary totals, value of pelts, and so on for rats or muskrats, beaver, mink, otter, coon, fisher, um, mostly in the Belgrade area, but it's a complete record. Um, there are uh, Steve Powell has a notebook. Um, on one day, uh, he counted in October 8, 1955, 43 hunters on Greenpoint, Middle Ground, Swan Island, 161 ducks, 91 black, 43 blue winged teal, 9 green winged teal, 3 widgeon, 3 mallard, total of 155, lost 6 ducks someplace, he said. <laughs> Estimate 1,000 hunters on the bay and 3,000 ducks shot that day. 
Also car and hunter check same day, 140 cars, 237 hunters. Also airplane check of the number of hunters and gunning floats and so on. Um, so he was big on numbers and he kept track of everything. Uh, all of his beer, bird banding and deer tagging records from 1947 to 1958. Small birds, deer, ducks, geese, um, showing sex, uh, band numbers, and so on. And whenever any of those birds or deer were later harvested, he took that information and tracked how far the deer had traveled from home, um, their weight compared to the last time that they were uh, a caught or whatever. Uh, observations of duck flights, showing when the peak seasons of ducks on the bay were so that the state could adjust um, seasons if they needed to. Um, they also were involved with some of the first work in determining where the great flyways were, that the, especially the geese and ducks followed as they migrated. Um, there are six inches of six by four by six index cards of the Swan Island deer repellent studies that they did. Um, there are file folders on deer returns, deer tag returns by year, timber and hay sales. Um, a lot of information on Fry Mountain, which was um, in, not Freedom, but just east of here. Um, and that's the tower that's now out on Swan Island. Um, all kinds of correspondence, including uh, correspondence with Alfred O. Gross, who was the great ornithologist here at Bowdoin. Um, and on and on and on. So it's really quite a collection. Uh, there are probably six storage cartons of records, uh, probably about 600 still photos, of about 100 of which at this point have been scanned, uh, and then all the films. So it was really overall a lovely collection for Bob to keep. So we're going to look at a couple of the um, photos now. So this is Bob, as you can tell. This is uh, Steve, I'm sorry. This is Polly. Um, looks like a young girl, but uh, really she's just a very petite woman. Uh, loved the animals as much as um, Steve did. Uh, she especially liked the young uns. There used to be lots of rabbits on Swan Island. Um, I don't think there are many, if any, out there anymore. Raccoons, and that's more typical of Steve with a pipe. Now, he was a pipe smoker. Fox. Six hour old fawn from out in the island. I don't know what kind of a camera he used. Um, and some of the pictures that are in the collection are official inland fish and wildlife photos as well. Um, here they're getting ready to release some deer. And according to Bob, according to Steve, uh, both deer and moose love tobacco. And often um, the deer or the moose would come over to uh, Steve and try and knock the cigarettes or his pipe tobacco out of his pocket so they could get at it. This is Mrs. Dunbar. As you can see, they did live with nature out in the island. There's a deer attracted to the pipe. Yes, um, Clarence Dun uh, Mrs. Dunbar's husband, Clarence, was one of the island uh, workers and managers. They had two or three people out there on staff just maintaining the um, landscape. They, the initial reason for the island, as I mentioned, was for deer repellent studies in a controlled environment. But they also, uh, because they used state money, they had to really spell out what they intended to do. They also talked about um, maintaining uh, fields for migratory waterfowl, in particular the geese. And for many years, it was the geese that attracted people to Swan Island. They would go out and look at the thousands of geese in the fields. Um, they also did some work, supposedly, with uh, other game birds out there, although they never did a whole lot of work uh, that I can see from the records. In terms of the deer repellent, they did develop a repellent called Zip. Um, that was one of those things that would have appeared in big block letters, stay away from, on Rachel Carson's list. Um, but it made a lot of money for Goodrich uh, and was very effective. Uh, for many years, so they were successful with that. Okay, so here's one of the banding books, and you can see is a deer tag. Yeah. 
the, the books are all about the same, but this is the kind of records that were kept. Uh, so here's the way that they um, trapped the deer. They used a, something, a design they came up with, which was similar to the way they used to trap rabbits. Uh, and right here, they're tagging the deer's ear with a, with a number tag. Uh, this is release data uh, from 1946 to 1958, uh, how many deer they released and where. And you can see there were a tremendous number of deer released. There were uh, normally at that time, because the fields were so open, about 180 deer living on the island at one time. And they'd trap 20 or 30 and get them off the island, and they'd go out and do a count, and there'd still be as many out there. Um, but they did let them uh, go all sorts of places, some locally, some further away. And there were some that were released, let's say, within four or five miles of Swan Island that actually made it back to the island. Uh, others, especially if they took them out to Monhegan or something, they didn't have quite some good luck getting back. So here's the deers tagged at Swan Island by years, and there's 365 deer tagged in 12 years, 13 years. Um, so the deer herd was much more prolific out there then than it is now. There were also more open fields out there, and they were managed uh, and planted with really uh, wonderful clover and stuff that the deer liked. Uh, here's that uh, zip deer repellent. What was they looking at? Oh, look, son. Well, that's a geese. Um, if you look here in the background, you can see them all out in the flats, too. Um, only one, I've been in Richmond since 1974, and only once have I seen massive flocks of geese come in like this. Um, and it was quite a sight. Okay, so these are geese trapped. And again, you can see they've got the, the numbers assigned to them and so on. Uh, in the films, you'll see some of how they do that. And here's he's keeping track of when the geese, the geese arrive at Swan Island. Um, and you can see it varies from year to year, but uh, he tied these into charts, and I think I've got one in here, um, showing when they are at peak on the bay. Uh, you wanted to give the hunters a good chance, but you also wanted to give the birds a chance without the hunters. Uh, so they'd be back next year. Um, so these are total bird counts on the bay at a given, on a given day, what they were estimating. Uh, now, if you get a couple thousand birds out there at a time, it were, it's a good day. Uh, Canada geese banded at Swan Island. Here you have the band numbers, the date they were banded, the date they were shot or caught, and where. And if you notice, um, they're all over the place, North Carolina, Virginia, um, Quebec. Uh, and this is the work that went into understanding how the flyways were functioning um, because of this, this kind of record keeping. Uh, here are some geese in a trap. Uh, they also had the, the, um, the feds come out with um, harpoon guns and nets that would go out and over the geese, but that didn't work as well as this. We do have some pictures of them, though, there in the 1950s. Uh, there was a woman in Richmond by the name of Frida Witham, who from 1952 to 1962 was the local journalist and photographer for the Kennebec Journal. And she was a good friend of Steve Powell's. Um, she took a wonderful picture of um, Governor Muskie and Steve together, which unfortunately I forgot to put in here. Um, but she left about 4,500 three by five black and white negatives that are now the property of the Richmond and Dresden Historical Societies. And there are also a lot of pictures uh, related to the island and stuff. This is Joe Stickney here, I think. Uh, not Joe Stickney, um, Don, um, no, the warden that was out in the island. And here they're banding the goose. This one had a 72 inch wingspan. Uh, they also, whenever they came across a blue goose or a Richardson goose or one of the unusual um, birds, they would get in touch with uh, Dr. Gross here at the college and uh, share information. There's Dr. Gross. And I think that may be a Richardson's goose, I'm not sure. Um, this is one of the state's first efforts to promote 
uh, waterfowl hunting on the bay. Uh, you can see it's dated 1957. Volume one, number one. I don't think they ever came out with a volume one, number two, or a volume two. <laughs> but it looked good. It's about a 16-page uh, booklet. Um, these are other duck species. Again, uh, banding. And here's that list that I uh, quoted from earlier with all the gunning floats and so on. So 217 gunning floats in the lower bay to Swan Island. Um, 1520 maybe now? And here's one of those charts that showed the numbers of birds on the bay um, at the, the, the peak of the triangles to our right as we look at it, that's 30,000 birds. And you can see that from day to day it did vary. Uh, the blue colored, colored in area at the top is the current open season at that time. Um, and again, based on this kind of information, they might adjust uh, the opening and closing dates of the season. Um, here are some notations from my diary which might be of interest. This is 1955. Um, saw 50 to 75 black ducks resting on water this evening. Saw first flock blue winged teal tonight. Saw a flock of 20 plus geese tonight. Many blue wings in the area. Largest concentration of blue wings I've ever seen in area. September 10th, many ducks, 50% teal, both blue and green, plus blacks. So he made a lot of observations as well, which uh, ha often have hard numbers to them, so that it's a good base uh, to compare uh, then and now, or even before to this point in time, uh, as a way to look at uh, pollution issues or uh, management issues. A little tug going down river. There's Polly. She um, worked right along with Steve. She uh, did a lot of the work with the geese um, and other things. There's the old Richmond Dresden Bridge in the background, excuse me, Kennebec River Bridge in the background. Look like they've had a good day on the water. Um, they also, the state harvested wood on the island. Uh, when the state took it over, a lot of it had been pretty well cut over. Uh, the Bath Box Company had been out there. Um, but there's Steve out poking around on some of the sticks. And this he claims is a 250-year-old pine, and it looks good-sized, but look at it next to Polly. <laughs> <laughs> looks like it started growing in King Arthur's time. And that's Joe Stickney getting wood ready for the season. Um, they did farm out there on the island. These were uh, bean fields, and of course, um, this is where they tried out a lot of their deer repellent stuff to uh, try and keep the deer out of the bean fields. Heading out across the flats, check on the, the geese traps. There's Polly down the southern end of the island. And I'm not quite sure where that is on the island, but southern end. Uh, Steve also uh, hunted and trapped. Um, this is out on the island. Um, I don't know why that one's in there. You can see how the field succession has gone from 56 to 89. Um, there is less open land now than there was. And these pictures here are not in the right order. Um, this, was, this is Jerry the Moose who was the first male moose raised in captivity, at least in Maine. Um, and he was orphaned when his mother was hit by a car, and he was brought up here, uh, and then finally shipped to the uh, Bronx Zoo. And um, I had to track that down. So I got this back from the Wildlife Conservation Society in Bronx, New York, who oversees the zoo. It says, Jerry arrived on March 3rd, 1947, and we were told that he was born in 1945. He was gifted to us by Commissioner George Stovey of the Inland Fisheries and Game in Augusta, Maine. His weight on arrival was 615 pounds, and his height at the Withers was 5 foot 7. Jerry died on February 20th, 1955. Aside from that male, we also received a female February 23rd, 48, from the same commissioner, and she was named Molly and lived till April 3rd, 1955. She also sent an article 
that was in their magazine from 1947, and I'm going to read just a little bit about it. The introduction of new animals to life in the zoological park ought by this time to be completely routine. Certainly we have had moose in the past, an elk, and the arrival in the past month within a few days of each other of a bull moose, a bull elk, and four cow elks ought to have been taken in stride. But if one learns nothing else over the years, one does learn that animals are unpredictable and there is no such thing as routine. Take the case of Jerry, our new bull moose. Jerry was orphaned a few hours or a few days after birth in the summer of 1945 by a speeding truck that killed his mother. Hand-reared in the Swan Island Refuge near Bristol, Maine, he grew up with no acquaintance with others of his kind. What then would be his reaction when he came to live in our zoological park in a two and a half acres of woodland that had since 1942 been the home of two cow moose? We found out. Jerry came to us by truck in a commodious crate that he liked very much, so much in fact, that he did not want to leave it and cried in a tiny calf-like ball when, he tried, when we tried to coax him out. Finally, we had to pull the crate out from under him and whisk it away before he could get back inside. Jerry was liberated in a small wire-fenced feeding corral while the two cow moose were wandering about on their lawful occasions in a distant corner of the wood. All was well. Jerry was contentedly munching cut vegetables when suddenly an apparition appeared. We knew it was just old Maud, the tamest and gentlest of our cow moose. Jerry obviously didn't know what it could be. One look and he bolted for the back of his corral, banged into the barrier and began to frenzied running up and down. At each turning he threw a startled look over his shoulder at the apparition, but each look grew a little longer than the last. Undeniably, there was something attractive about this great shaggy, what is it, outside the fence. <laughs> Maud finally wandered away, Jerry calmed down, and that night when head keeper of mammals Gus Schilling made the rounds with his flashlight, he found Jerry curled up on one side of the feed corral fence and Maud cozily bunked up against him on the other side. Since then, we have not worried about Jerry's introduction to the zoo. To complete Jerry's background, we should say that he is a lusty, healthful two-year-old, five foot eight at the shoulder, that he weighs 615 pounds and bears with some diffidence an infinitesimally, an infinitesimal pair of antlers. For this magnificent addition to our collection, we owe thanks to Commissioner George J. Strobe, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Game of Maine. Commissioner Strobe is extremely fond of Jerry, but he realized that the Swan Island Refuge facilities are not geared for handling a 615-pound and still-growing moose. Um, so, here's Jerry. So this is the crate they were talking about, and I believe that this is where they were loading him up to take him to the Bronx. Um, this fenced area is still on the island. They call it the, an exclusion area. And some have said it was where they were trying to raise pheasants and so on. But you can see they did use it to uh, give Jerry a home while he was there. And you can see Polly was right at home with them all. They had two um, tame deer uh, and then Jerry the moose. There's one of the tame deer. I don't know if that's Bambi or I've forgotten the other one's name. So I think that's, there he is, about ready to head off. So those are the, the pictures, some of the pictures from Steve. And if you bear with me just a minute, see if I can, he said hit escape. Got about 10 seconds of the Statue of Liberty and then we're, this is, uh, they just returned from a trip to South America. Okay, so this is Ealing on the Eastern River. And someone earlier asked me about old films. This film was stored in the top of the apple barn, where's hotter and all get out. And uh, you can see that uh, Northeast Historic Film was able to do a pretty good job with it. Yeah, well, there's a young lad there. I don't know yeah. if, if Richard can tell us who it is, identify him. Um, the film also has a number code on the edge of it, which I never knew, so that um, they could tell when each of these films, when the film was produced, not necessarily when it was used. And I'm going to look right here and five, 
18. Uh, most of this is 51, 50, and 53. So that young lad, 1951, what is he, eight years old? You get a good, better picture of him here in a minute. I don't know if anybody eels this way anymore, do they, Ed? Hmm? Around? I know. So are these eel in the mud? I believe so, yeah. They, he's down on the bottom. Is that you, Richard? No. You skate better than that, right? I don't remember that there are any records of the number of eel taken or anything in his records, but uh, one of the films I did not bring to show tonight is uh, their beaver trapping under the ice, and it's a similar situation where you have to keep the the, the access holes uh, free of ice. Um, in that case, they'd set the traps and come back the next day, and they'd have to break all this ice back out again in the slush. There are also some. Um, Quite a few pictures of things like uh, salmon fishing up at Moosehead, both in summer and winter. And when I saw uh, winter fishing at Moosehead, 1951, 52, I said, oh, I'm going to see some of my first um, snowmobiles. But they didn't have snowmobiles. Instead, what they had was they had airplanes with no wings. And they would just use the propellers to pull them around in the fuselage and on the wheels. It's really quite something. In my work at the Pondleboro Courthouse, one of the things that we have a large collection of are nitty noddies, which are the things that you wound yarn on, and everyone's different. It's the same way with uh, eel spears. Um, you rarely will find two that look alike. They were a really uh, locally crafted item, although this looks pretty fancy. Now, we have placed a full set of these films uh, several places, including Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. And at some point, we hope to get uh, most of these that aren't family pieces uh, available online so that people can enjoy them. Did they have turkeys on the island at that time? I don't think so. Um, I think turkeys were pretty well gone in Maine up till. 1970s or so when they reintroduced them around here? Reintroduced them, yeah. A stick fish. <laughs> Does anybody recognize that house? I thought it was probably Charlotte's next door to me. But yeah, maybe. I've never seen it from the water really looking at it. All right, now we're switching to the other thing we do in the winter around here. I was glad to see all the camps out upriver as I went up to Augusta this week. Mom said they used to drink in these camps. <laughs> used to? Down in uh, Bodenham, uh, in behind off Route 24, um, between 24 and the Pork Point Road, and between the Richmond end of the Pork Point Road and the river, um, back in on the state land, went in there one time 10, 12 years ago, and it was like finding the elephant graveyard. There was a whole series of old ice fishing shacks in there that are just skeletons of them, and a lot of them were the old aluminum printing plates from the Bath Brunswick Times Record. They're just sitting there. It was totally unexpected. <laughs> That's 
Polly again. Technology hasn't changed much for this. Oh, too slow. <laughs> now, Bob Boyd also swore that the guy fell down one of the holes and came up in another house. Is that <laughs> 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 well, that's a problem in the tidal river, though. You don't always come back up where you go down. Shortly after I moved to Richmond, the big thing was to take cars out on the ice on the river. And uh, the big thing was to go between Big Swan and Little Swan. And it was always black ice. You never knew if there was really anything there or not. But one day, um, several gentlemen, including a local car entrepreneur in Richmond today, uh, and others, brand, uh, this guy had a brand new Subaru. It didn't have 50 miles on it. They decided to go out in the river and they got down halfway down the length of Swan Island and they hit a buckle in the ice, and the car started going down, and two of them bailed out the windows because they knew if the car went down, they were in trouble. And it got wedged there, so they had to run, and it was about 20 degree day, night, they had to run all the way back up to Richmond, get come alongs, logs, change the clothes, go back, winch the car out of the hole by drilling a hole in the ice, dropping the log through with the chain to pull the car out. And the next morning, this brand new Subaru had everything pulled out of it, every mat, every door panel, all over the yard. I said, what went on, you guys? Thankfully, they didn't invite me. <laughs> Probably Steve underneath with a pole. I'm just going to skip this ahead just a little bit. That's a good day's work. Good tide. Okay, so this here is uh, deer trapping and release. And this uh, contraption, the trap, was something that they actually developed based on something that was used for rabbits. Um, they tried several different things, and this seemed to work the best.
<laughs> uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, uh, whether it was just because it was shelter and they had the, um, the nice green tips in there that drew them in. Probably some signage this way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the stuff they still drive, Joe, huh? The wardens aren't dressed as well anymore. <laughs> Um, there were a couple of summer residents. The last one, Mr. Priest, was there until about 1950. And they, he sold his property, but got a life estate to stay out there. Um, but there weren't many people. <laughs> That's the mobile home he's in now. Um, in the wintertime, off, often they could not get off the island, so they would release them again right on the island. Uh, and there's several deer that captured year after year that way. Um, but they did take them when they could get off island to all sorts of places. I think it's in the boathouse now. It looks like it. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I saw that and I said, why do they have horns on the box? And I, I think it just is that they're going down the road, it would force air through. Yeah. Those are the Dresden Blueberry Barons, aren't they? Is that Katahdin? Yeah. One of the things they did discover is that deer really don't travel very far. Um, if they often were found <coughs> or were harvested within a mile of where they were first tagged years later. Um, about four miles away is the furthest that um, a deer in its normal range that they found. Although there were a couple that were let go a little further away who did, didn't make it back five or six miles.
Uh, this one I'm going to skip over, but this is, I think, they're heading out to Monhegan with deer aboard. And as you can see, the fishermen were quite enamored of the project. I think there were 23 of them lifting the crate and all at one point in the picture. Um, they often would take them to other state lands, um, but other than that, I'm not sure. Uh, this is the end of a hunting. Okay, now this is um, some geese footage. Am I frozen? Is it moving? Okay. And again, one of the first activities on the island was to uh, keep fields open and plant them with clover and other things that would attract uh, the geese as they were passing through. Um, there were many more geese passing through then than there are today. And again, it was the geese that attracted many of the first visitors to the island and sort of was one of the things that led to the construction of the, um, the shelters on the island, the Adir Adirondack-style shelters out there. Reasons, the main reason people came out to the island was either to see the deer or to see the geese. That was, those were the big attractions to okay, begin with. So just the, the yep. And I'm sure there was federal monies in a particular grant program that came along that sounded good at the time. Seasonal migration of the geese? Yes, yeah. Well, two ways. I mean, yeah. coming through going north and coming through going south. Um, but September was when a lot of the film was shot, I, I think. Uh, I don't know. I know some places they have more geese than they can handle. Um, it may just be this particular flyway has been less favorable. Um, don't forget that at this time there were a lot more nutrients in the bay because of the pollution. And that definitely had an impact. If you talk to uh, John Lichter here, uh, who's done a lot of work with migratory fowl on the bay, um, when we had a pollution problem we had a lot of geese and ducks. When we cleaned up the pollution, a lot of the geese and ducks found other places to, to feed. So they were thriving on the pollution? Well, indirectly. I mean, the pollution would allow more plants to grow, which allowed more smaller critters to grow in the plants. And One of the stories that um, Frida Witham, the woman who was the reporter locally, told me, and uh, Bob Gleason seemed to reiterate it, was that the whole story of, of Muskie being out in the river and seeing stuff floating by he didn't like, and that's what led to the Clean Water Act. Well, uh, the way that Frida told it and the way that Bob, uh, Steve, uh, Bob seemed to agree was that, in fact, um, Governor Muskie was out with Steve uh, in a float 
on the Kennebec, uh, right off Green Point, when an unmentionable floated by, and that's when he said, we're going to take care of this. Um, so even though Muskie came from up the Androscog, and the Kennebec has some claim to the Clean Water Act. Did the schools still do wildlife tours for the kids in school, grade schools? They don't take them out? Well, not, not that I know of, but yeah. they, go, they go to Swan Island. I can hear him. Can you hear him? Mm -hmm. Would be out there in a canoe right about now, huh? With a hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of nice not to have sound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was a student here at Bowdoin, I took an ornithology course with Chuck Huntington, who superseded um, Dr. Gross, and uh, we went up to uh, the Bay of Fundy, up to Graham and Ann Island, where the college has a ornithology station on Kent Island, and uh, we had to spend the night aboard boat in the harbor because uh, Meyer and the caretaker's boat was out of service, and he borrowed one, and the seas were up, and as evening set in, the entire sky from horizon to horizon was full of uh, chevrons of brant flying over. I'd never seen anything like that. I also saw my first American bald eagle on that trip in Canada. Back when they were scarce. Okay, we're about to see um, one of the goose traps, uh, and then after that I'll end it. Um, there's one of the, the traps on the flats. The geese would get in the high water and then the water would go out and they didn't. Right, and there's also netting down the sides, so they'd actually pull the netting up and go in with a big net to get, take them out of there and band them. Um, but what triggered the net to drop, I'm not sure. I mean, they had to get under the netting to get in there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to end it there. Um, actually, I'll just leave it on. But uh, we do have a couple people here tonight that uh, knew Steve. Um, uh, Bob Gleason's brother, Richard's here. And uh, the Shepherds, who, as a young boy, was up gunning off Greenpoint. And I don't know if either of you would like to say anything about Steve. Yeah. <laughs> sure, we'd love to hear from you. Well, you didn't uh, say too much about his personality. He had quite a personality. And uh, he was uh, quite a jokester, and he used to pull around a lot. And uh, I can remember <laughs> 45 years ago with my wife, um, before we were married. Right. What did he used to say? Uh, oh. He'd say, "Let me look at you. you. You don't look like you're heavy enough. You don't. You don't yeah, look yeah, like you have yeah. meat on your bones." And to take me upstairs and put me on the bathroom scales to see how much I weigh. That's that's the way Steve was. He was just always joking around, kidding around, and um, 
I can remember uh, one time, uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey, and Bob and I both grew up in New Jersey, but Bob started spending summers at Green Point at a young age. And um, he said to me one time, uh, will you have me uh, out the field and get me a zucchini, will you? I said, a what? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. And so he was not, uh, not pleased that I didn't know what it was, but I knew what it was when we were done. And uh, there's all kinds of stories like that. They're just uh, a very interesting man. He, uh, the way he died was, uh, he was an over, a very overweight man, you, especially up when he got up around 50. He uh, had diabetes and all that stuff. And uh, he was, uh, he and Bob, my brother Bob, were driving out in the uh, car out of the driveway, out of Green Point. And then uh, Steve was in the passenger seat and Bob was driving. and. Uh, Steve just passed out. That was the end of him. And uh, I didn't get to go to his funeral because I was in the Army at the time, but uh, in the uh, early 70s. Uh, and then I'm sad to say my brother died this past summer. So <laughs> that's all, all I can tell you. What happened to Polly? Polly, um, uh, in the 80s, uh, went into the hospital for an operation and did not come out. She had diabetes too. <laughs> yeah, there's two things I remember about uh, Steve. I didn't, you know, I was just a young guy and we started coming up here and we're only here for uh, uh, the start of duck season, so maybe we'd be here three or four days, so it was part of our ritual since the 50s, but uh, not enough to get to know a lot of people. But what I remember with Steve, uh, the one thing sticks in my mind was the Usually, season opened on a Saturday, and, and Sunday there'd be no shooting, and, and Steve would be out uh, pulling a boat along the shoreline with a big black lab, and just picking up cripples. I don't know if that's legal or not, but you know, uh, that first day of hunting season, people are letting fly with everything. There's a lot of cripples and, and so forth, and I, I thought that was, uh, I thought it was a pretty good thing for him to do, was to get out there and get these birds that weren't going to make it, and, and so forth, and have something productive happen to them. And then the other time that uh, something associated with Steve was when they were dedicating uh, Swan Island or, the, or the, the management area, and they had a lot of uh, a lot of state uh, wardens and tech, uh, you know official people down on the landing. I don't know if any of you were there that that time, but uh, Sue and I were there and, and uh, with the dedication. And so all the big wheels were at the landing. And put 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 up comes the up the river comes a, a little float boat with a, a couple of uh, slickers in there uh, had to be downtown or down downstate people or something but they came up and they tied up about 50 feet away from all the wardens and they started throwing black ducks out <laughs> you know I, you know I think you could have gotten one black duck at the time and they sat there throwing the black ducks you know, and the wardens are going. <laughs> you know, like, here you have this solemn situation with Steve, and meanwhile, there's some, they had no clue. You know, they had a pile of black ducks sitting there, and I don't know whatever happened, but it was, it was amazing to see who was going to flinch, you know, whether to stop the ceremony or get to nail these guys or what. The, the <laughs> yeah, many of you know that by the Gardner Dumeric House, the salt box, there's the boathouse, and then there's that sort of covered picnic area. Well, that was built by Steve to entertain the masses, especially the commissioner and all of his buddies from Augusta. And you saw the height of Steve and Polly, and that's why it's so low. <laughs> uh, the other thing about um, Steve and Polly is they never had any children, but they raised dogs. And they had uh, Springer Spaniels, I think, and, uh, for the most part. And there's a whole, one of these old uh, films is just them with dogs and puppies going everywhere. Um, so they did uh, really love uh, all animals. Um, domestic and wild, and I think you can see that a little bit in the, the, the pictures and the movies that he took. And as I say, all of this is public information. Um, if anybody wants uh, access to it at this point, they can see me. Um, the